It may very well be one of the most controversial companies in our country's history. Blackwater USA has been called the largest private army in the world. The jury in Washington convicted four former Blackwater security guards in the 2007. My guest tonight is the controversial founder and former CEO of Blackwater, Eric Prince. You do admit that Blackwater personnel have shot and killed innocent civilians, don't you? I disagree with that. Branded a war profiteer and a super mercenary by his critics, Prince's firm made over a billion dollars out of the so-called war on terror. It also highlighted the clear danger of using private contractors on the battlefield. And yet now he's back on the scene, trying to privatize the war in Afghanistan by offering to replace US and NATO troops there with his own private security force. But will handing the war to Prince really help end it? I'm Mehdi Hassan and I've come here to the Oxford Union to go head to head with Eric Prince, a former Navy SEAL and the founder of Blackwater. I'll challenge him on war crimes in Iraq, his plans for a private army in Afghanistan and his loyal support for President Donald Trump. Tonight, I'll also be joined by Sean McFate, a former private military contractor, former officer in the US Army and author of the book, The New Rules of War. Gaith Abdul Ahad, an award-winning Guardian journalist from Iraq who's covered conflicts across the Middle East. And Colonel Tim Collins, a former commander in the British Army and founder of New Century, a private military consulting company. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Eric Prince. <laughs> Eric Prince is currently the Deputy Chairman and Executive Director of Frontier Services Group, a Hong Kong-based security and logistics firm. Thanks. Eric Prince, thank you for joining me on Head to Head. Thanks for having me. Um, you're back in the news with a new plan to privatize, basically, the US-led war in Afghanistan. But you were the founder and CEO of Blackwater, perhaps the world's most notorious private security firm, which during the Iraq war became a byword for violence, corruption, lawlessness, and yet you've never apologized for any of it. Uh, I think that's an unfair characterization. The company did exactly what the US government asked us to do, which was to protect diplomats, reconstruction officials visiting uh, UN or, uh, or other congressional delegations. We did more than 100,000 missions. No one under our care was ever killed or injured. And, uh, and people try to characterize the company as, uh, as overly aggressive. Less than one half of 1% of all those missions resulted in the discharge of a firearm. In an era when you had lots of violence in the capital, yes. I mean, Baghdad really was the center of gravity of the insurgency. And so we had, um, you know, 41 of our men were lost in action doing that mission. So you mentioned there that the US government asked you to do a job and you did it. You mentioned that you lost men on your watch. What you didn't mention is that you also killed a lot of people. Um, you say, well, you know, percentages is great. Let's talk about individual cases. In 2005, Blackwater guards fired 70 rounds into an Iraqi civilian's car, forcing the State Department to investigate. In 2006, according to leaked Pentagon documents, Blackwater guards fired indiscriminately at Iraqi civilians, killing, among others, an ambulance driver. In 2007, Blackwater guards shot and killed 14 Iraqi civilians in what's been called the Nisor Square Massacre, or Baghdad's Bloody Sunday. That is the record that a lot of people around the world remember when they hear the name Blackwater. Sure, and when you do 100,000 missions, it's easy to take some things out of context. But remember, uh, you had many thousands of insurgents actively trying to kill Americans, and not just American servicemen, but the most uh, newsworthy Americans there, diplomats. And when the State Department asked you to But the to people drive I'm them, mentioning weren't insurgents. You killed, at Nissau Square, your men killed a mother and son on their way to an appointment, a doctor and a son. They killed a nine-year-old sadly, boy, shot sadly, in the head. Sadly, the insurgents don't wear uniforms. They would drive ambulances filled with explosives. They would drive... So, you, so your men thought they were shooting at insurgents? Uh, a car bomb doesn't give you much time to decide. There was no car bomb at Nissau Square in 2007. Actually, right before Nissau Square event, there was. There was Not a at large... Nissau Square, there was no car bomb. Excuse me? Less than five minutes before that event happened, there was a large car bomb that went off where there was a protective team of ours protecting a USAID official. And, uh, and sadly, that, uh, that car bomb went off. The team decided to move through there. And uh, a support team went to block the traffic circle so that... Uh, uh, the fleeing team could yeah. move through smoothly and not be ambushed. When the, when the intelligence provided by the State Department and the U.S. government says, be on the lookout for a white Kia, yeah. okay, and all the other cars in the traffic circle stop, except for a white Kia, 
Sadly, sometimes the guys have a split second to make that of decision. Of course, and um, Blackwater say the white Kia stopped, of, as you well know, because you've discussed this far more than I have. All of the eyewitnesses there say that there was no white Kia heading towards you. The US colonel who turned up on the day said that there was no enemy activity involved. He said it was a criminal event and an excessive shooting. A US court of law in December prosecuted one of your men for first degree murder, for killing Ahmed Rabai and his mother. At Nissel Square. In, 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 yes. And three other, hold on, let me finish. Three other men were prosecuted for manslaughter. Four of your men, murder and manslaughter, in not Iraqi courts, US courts. That's right. And they prosecuted them four times and they finally got a conviction. The first time he was thrown out for prosecutorial misconduct. Guilty. The second, they found him guilty. No, no. The first time he was thrown out for prosecutorial misconduct. The second time it was overturned. The third time it was uh, a mistrial. The federal government finally got them in a DC, sir, in a DC jury. On the fourth time, is they a tried DC it. jury not a legitimate jury. Um, I would say a, a jury of your peers does not really compare to the rest of America. No, that's a. Oh, that's a okay, okay. So some juries are legitimate, some not. Like so-called judges, I've heard that language before. But they were prosecuted for murder and manslaughter. Do you have any regrets for the people who died? A nine-year-old boy shot in the head. Wasn't an insurgent. Of course we did. Of course we we hired as the company. We hired the prosecutor that prosecuted Saddam to go find each of these families to pay Salacia to make amends as best as possible. Did you ever reach out to them? Did I personally? Yeah. Uh, I haven't found. No, I haven't found all of them. But uh, we certainly apologize to the ones I've had contact with. And it's not just these killings and, and the, the, these killings that are documented. Um, it goes beyond just guards, as you know. Blackwater got billions of dollars in U.S. government contracts. Not billions. More than a billion dollars in U.S. government contracts during that yeah, period. Over, over 12 and, years. And yet a scathing U.S. State Department investigation found that Blackwater, quote, was overbilling the State Department and manipulating personnel records. Its guards were partying, drinking, and even crashed an armored car and saw themselves as, quote, above the law. Pretty damn it. The U.S. State Department is saying this about the company they're giving contracts to. Uh, overbilling and manipulating... We never paid any fines for anything like that. That's a fact. You paid fines for a lot of things. The only thing we paid a fine for was uh, an ITAR violation. I'll give you an example. And the only, sorry, did you say the only thing you paid a fine for? You paid $7.5 million fine in 2012 to settle 17 criminal charges. You paid a $42 whoa, whoa. million dollar settlement sorry. to the State Department in 2010 for illegal arms sales. Uh, at 2012, I'd already sold the business. I sold it in 2010. But the cases go back beyond 2010. The criminal charges related to all sorts of things that went back years, including South Sudan. You broke U.S. sanctions to try and sell weapons to South Sudan. No, going against... there's no weapons in South Sudan. Uh, there was a proposal on the no, table. No. You never put a proposal on the table to sell the Kiev's government worth no, $100 million. I, I, actually, the, the, the issue there was a, a satellite phone. So you did put a proposal on the table to salve Kiev's government? No, no, what no, the State Department complained about then, that was back okay. in 2005. Okay. It was a, my a, point is, an actual, a very dangerous satellite right. phone, the same thing you can buy in Heathrow Duty Free. Okay, we can argue about the fines. Let's just deal with this report. The U.S. State Department said you were manipulating personal records, overbilling the State Department, and your guards were partying, drinking, and even crashed an armored car. That was a State Department investigation in 2007. Look, we employed thousands of people. And uh, I would never say that uh, the men were perfect. We didn't employ angels. We employed veterans who volunteered to serve their country again in a very dangerous place. And you, like I said, 41 of them paid the ultimate cost, and hundreds more were seriously wounded. It's a maimed. problem when you say we didn't employ angels, we employed veterans, but right now you want to do it all again. That's the problem, is it not? Um, well, here's the thing. After, after 17 years of war, Okay, where the United States is spending more than the entire UK budget, defense budget, just this year, and still losing in Afghanistan. Yep. I think it's time to look at a different way. So to I want it. to talk about Afghanistan, but just before we get to your Afghan plan, I just want to get to what drives you when you kind of come up with these plans to do private security, especially in a lot of these Muslim-majority countries, because you yourself have referred to the people your men were fighting in Iraq as barbarians who crawled out of the sewer. You say in your memoir, these were the chanting barbarians American troops had been sent to liberate? Sure. If you, if, if people that think it's okay to drive a car bomb into the middle of a square, into the middle of a marketplace, while to attempt to kill an American and in, 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 in doing so they kill dozens and dozens of civilians, absolutely that's barbaric. Which is true. I think if you refer to terrorists, you call them whatever you want. But you said these were the chanting barbarians American troops had been sent to liberate. You weren't sent to liberate terrorists. Sounds like you're talking about Iraqis. Sir, uh, look, the, the, it's the, from the, your the, words from your memory. The, the, decision, the decision of Iraq. Please. The, the, the U.S. decision to go to, to uh, liberate Iraq from Saddam Hussein, who did a lot more uh, horrid things than uh, we can even speak of here, uh, that was certainly the intent. 
I certainly had no role in that policy decision. Okay, but you don't refer to, you don't believe Iraqis are barbarians, obviously. No, but I believe that terrorists that, that crank off car bombs in a city square certainly are. Okay, you're proposing now to privatize the US-led war in Afghanistan. You've suggested replacing almost 50,000 NATO troops and private contractors with 2,000 US special operators and 6,000 contractors, and you wanna cut spending there, you think, by $30 billion a year, which sounds great, and I think you and I, one thing we can definitely agree on is we both think the Afghan war is not going well and has been a bit of a failure. Um, but given 140,000 NATO troops couldn't control that country or defeat the Taliban back in 2011, what on earth makes you think that a few thousand contractors are gonna do it now under your command? Because after 9-11, I'm gonna take you back. In the five days after 9-11 happened when President Bush had a war cabinet meeting up at Camp David, the Pentagon, the best thing that the most expensive military in the world came with was some missile and some bombing strikes and then a conventional invasion via Pakistan the following April. Okay, so literally while the headquarters of the Pentagon is still smoldering, the best the US military came with was the most conventional and most cumbersome approach. It was the CIA that said, money, authorities, the right people, and we'll get after the Taliban. And that worked, okay? Less than 100 special operators, CIA case officers, paramilitary guys, and SF guys, backed by air power, and they smashed the Taliban in a matter of weeks. They toppled them, but that's fine, you toppled them. Yes. But controlling a country requires more than 6,000 people, sure. Correct, but then the United States repeated the Soviet battle plan. Okay. So it's, I'm not advocating- but What is your battle plan? That 6,000 people can do what 140,000 couldn't? Sure. I'm not an expert on maths, but that seems weird. Well, here's the thing. You have 15,000 US troops there now, there's about 7,000 NATO, and another 30,000 contractors. So I'm not advocating a privatization, I'm advocating a rationalization at a significant cost savings. It, the way the US has been deploying there, they send a unit for seven or eight months. They yep. spend the first two or three months getting to know the area, and then a couple of months they're very productive, and then the last month they're ready to pack up, and they lift and shift and they go home, okay? And then you, you rinse and repeat and you do that again, and we've done 30 plus rotations of troops like that. Yep. And so you have no continuity. Instead, I would take the same special forces veterans that have been working there, from the US, from NATO, and the guys you say are not angels. These are the same people the US military and NATO has been spending, sending there for the last 17 okay. years. But the difference is, as a contractor, they can go and attach to the same unit and live in the same valley and live and work and train and fight with those guys, with the Afghan counterparts, month after month for years so they have that continuity. Isn't the Second, problem the Afghan government, they don't like your plan. They say it's a non-starter. They say under no circumstances Will we allow the war to become a, quote, private for profit business? The former Afghan president, Hamid Karzai, said he vehemently opposes your proposal. It's a non-starter. I think he would say differently if you asked him now. I he literally it, asked his office on Friday and they said they're dead against it. <laughs> well, I've talked, to other people in his, I, I've talked to other people in his office who disagree with that. Okay, okay? And the current Here's Afghan the government, Here's have the they thing. changed their position as well? They uh, said in October, under uh, no circumstances. I, I doubt very much that Ashraf Ghani will, will win in the next election. So you're waiting for a change of president to get your plan signed off. Look, here's the thing. If they don't do a plan like this, if there is not a skeletal structure support supporting the Afghan forces, the next president's gonna wind up like Najibullah did. The problem is the way you pitched it is, do you think it was helpful to tell the Afghans we're gonna be like, quote, the East India Company, which violently ruled India on behalf of the British Empire in the 18th and 19th centuries? Was it wise to talk about having a viceroy in charge of the country? I mean, you're not hiding the fact that this is a colonialist project when you use sure. language like that. But here's the thing, the United States has no one person that's in charge of Afghan policy. There's nobody that the president can turn to and say, why is Afghanistan after this? He has a special envoy, many... Zalmay Khalilzad. Yeah, sure, that, that, that doesn't help. He doesn't control the military, he doesn't control the intelligence funding, he doesn't control Even policy. Even if I agree Pakistan. with that, do you think you calling need... someone a viceroy in charge of an East India company is gonna go down well with brown folks? <laughs> Look. For 250 years, that security model largely worked of mostly local forces with a few professional mentors only acting as a skeletal structure support. But the difference is, I'm not there as a colonial power. These, these, these mentors, right, the contractors, the special forces veterans are serving as adjuncts in the Afghan forces, accountable to the, um, the Afghan Minister of Defense and of course the president. If they're flying aircraft, we actually found two-seat aircraft yep. where the contractor never makes the weapons release decision, it is always the Afghan. But he flies the plane. Safety pilot, sure. Okay, in 2004 in Afghanistan, a Blackwater pilot flying a plane uh, with US soldiers on board flew the plane into the side of a mountain. He crashed the plane into the mountain, killing six passengers on board, including three US soldiers. 
The captain's last words, this Blackwater employee flying the plane, his last words were, I swear to God, they wouldn't pay me if they knew how much fun this was. You were paying him, Eric Prince. He'd only been in the country two weeks. Have you or your employees learned any lessons from that horrific incident before you go back into Afghanistan? Sure, we operated 56 aircraft there safely for many, many years. We flew tens of thousands of missions safely. The difficult thing is when the DOD, your customer, asks you or tasks you to change your route so that the colonel on board could go view a, uh, an enemy area uh, on the way to, uh, as a deviation from the planned navigation, accidents happen. That's right. It's a dangerous and place. And yet the there's National been, Transportation nine... Safety Board and the US military both said that Blackwater provided insufficient oversight and guidance to the pilots involved in the crash. The widow of that colonel says that there was gross lack of judgment in managing this company. Who was managing the company at that time in 2004? Had you sold it then? The former operations officer of, the former operations officer of TF-160, the most elite helicopter unit in the world. So yeah, people that definitely understand aviation were in charge of the company. And yet the US military and the National Transportation Safety Board criticized your company's role in that accident. And they reinstated us and we were flying missions again within five days of that incident. Great. They needed us. Great. Good job, Bush administration. That's got nothing to do with the culpability that your company had for the deaths of those US soldiers. They didn't die at the hands of the Taliban. They died at the hands of Blackwater. They died at the hands of an accident made by a pilot flying in a very difficult area. I mean, Blackwater executives were emailing each other at the time. The email came out. It said, by necessity, the initial group hired to support the Afghanistan operation did not meet the criteria identified in email traffic and had some background and experience shortfalls overlooked in favor of getting the requisite number of personnel on board to start up the contract. You're saying it internally. Your own company's admitting to each other. These guys aren't experienced, but we need to get the contract up and running. Is this what you want to replicate in Afghanistan now? The pilots flying the mission that day had come from Alaska. They were, they were literally high country bush pilots. These are not people that are flying in the, uh, over the swamps of, of Florida. They were flying Why over the Why were your mountains. executives emailing each other saying that we have experienced shortfalls, but we need to get the contract up and running? Why were they saying that? Because the transportation, uh, uh, because the um, uh, Army Material Command was demanding the missions to support the missions. Here's the, the thing. It's the Army's fault. No, 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 no. Trying to serve a customer in a very difficult place. We flew tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of missions after that safely and no incident. Okay. Let's go to our panel uh, here in the Oxford Union. Uh, Sean McFate is a former private military contractor, former officer in the US Army, a professor at Georgetown, author of the book, The New Rules of War. Sean, you've said that US generals have laughed at Eric's plan for Afghanistan. Uh, you've called it unworkable and even magical thinking. Why? Blackwater, if this was a job interview, Mercer, Mercer, I would not give you the contract because Blackwater was simply a bodyguard shop in Iraq. You've never raised or deployed a military like you're advertising now. I have in places, and it takes a, it's a lot more sophisticated than just mentors in the field. It does inquire, require up to political leadership in Kabul, and they've already messaged that they don't support this. This is a dead deal, in my opinion. Well, and that you're mistaken, because we built the entire Afghan border police. It was 15,000 people. We did all the recruiting, the training, the vetting, and we actually had mentors that went in the field with them. And the success rate of these units, when our guys were allowed to go with them, effectively as training wheels, uh, their, their success rate went uh, okay. very, very high, and it worked. Okay. So, okay. so the, you know, I, I guess I'm the only guy that can say I've had 56 of my own aircraft in country doing that kind of work for the U.S. military. Okay. Gaith Abdul Ahad is an award-winning Guardian journalist from Iraq. You've covered conflicts in Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, and beyond. Uh, Gaith, how do the Iraqi people remember uh, Blackwater and Eric Prince, in your view? I mean, it's amazing to kind of sit here and listen to Eric kind of speak about Blackwater and the services they did in Iraq because the word Blackwater is synonymous with the words of the American occupation of Iraq. There is not a single Iraqi that I know. I mean, I'm one of those barbarians that was liberated by your country. But there is not a single Iraqi who would, you just mentioned the word Blackwater too, who would not say corruption, violence, and I'm not talking only about the Nassau Square kind of massacre, but I'm talking about the whole 10 years of the existence of these mercenaries. And I think part of the failure of the American project in Iraq was due to the, to the using of the contractors. Isn't, isn't, that, isn't that a major problem that you could concede that even if your plan is a good one, you shouldn't be the one doing it, given the legacy you've left behind. With some right, here's the thing, your, your math is a little skewed because the US didn't invade Iraq till 2003 and I sold the company in 2010, so that's certainly not 10 years. 
the company the company okay, tracked seven years. Look, we, we seven tracked years. we tracked all the vehicles where everybody was moving okay and there was dozens and dozens of times that it was brought up there was a blackwater event here blackwater event there and we didn't have people within 200 kilometers of that location the sad thing is blackwater became like kleenex it became do you know the why? End of, do you know why because you became this because world. because we were the largest one doing no because you were the worst profile mission. that's the reason i mean you gave the, well, I mean, in Iraq now, or in Yemen, or any of these places, they don't use the word contract or something. They use black water. In Yemen, in, in whatever, in Somalia, they don't use mercenaries or contract. If you've been in Afghanistan recently yes. as well, I'd be if you're reporting, do you think Afghans will welcome this plan that Eric is putting on the table? I've met administration officials, high security officials of the current Afghan administrations, opposition, and some of your own friends in Afghanistan, and all agree on one thing. It's not going to work. I agree with you totally that 17 years have been total waste. They followed the, you know, copied the, um, the Soviet plan. This is something we agree on. However, you're not meeting government officials. You're not talking to the military. You're okay. talking to uh, warlords. You, you're you're mistaken. I meet with dozens of Afghan officials, both in and out of the government from all over the country, and be they warlords. Tajik, Uzbek, Hazara, and Pashtun. And the warlords, right? All the people that are going to be voting in the Afghan election. So, so we're going like to move are, on because we've got one more, one more on our panel who needs to come in. Um, uh, Colonel Tim Collins is here. Uh, Tim, you once commanded British troops during Iraq. You gave that famous speech that a lot of us remember. In 2004, you quit the army and founded New Century, a private military consulting company. How would you evaluate what, what happened on, on Blackwater's watch? Well, it's a, it's a whole di different thing. I think what we have to uh, remember, and, and indeed I've discussed this with many times uh, with Eric, the um, U.S. State Department, the U.S. military, um, asked for services. They encouraged. They were enthusiastic to a point of hysteria that um, Blackwater go and do these missions. When it went wrong, they ran a mile. And so you have to look at those people and say, uh, at a point where there was uh, chairmen of the Joint Chiefs of Staff were visiting the facility and encouraging uh, more and more of these services to be uh, privatized and let out. And when things went wrong, they turned their back on it. Are you saying that Eric Prince and Blackwater were scapegoated by the US government? Well, I think that um, as a result of the rather expensive court case that you've been through, I think that was the, the conclusion in the end, is that um, the, the, the criticism I as a contractor would level um, is that um, Blackwater and the organization probably grew too fast. There was people who went initially who were of the highest uh, Delta Force, uh, te SEAL Team 6, Task Force 160. Some of the people who were coming in at the end had nowhere near that. And it's a question of who's supervising that. Because the people, when we look at them, who were in court and convicted were not of that quality, were not of that huge. How did they get there? How did they get there? Why were you hiring poor quality sure. people towards the end of your period Be in Iraq? Well, because there's literally not enough Delta Force or SEAL Team 6 or even SEALs for that matter uh, to do that mission. You could go to Marine, Infantry, or Army Infantry. The one uh, fair characterization that I will say is Blackwater did two types of missions. We worked for the State Department. They dictated you must drive a polished, waxed Suburban, okay, big SUV, armored, 11,000 pounds, lights and sirens, down the road, and when you drive the same route every day that the State Department tells you to, it's very easy for the enemy to set up an ambush. You keep saying engagement ambushes. Just to be clear for the audience, one study found that you, Blackwater, opened fire first in 84% of the shootings. It sure. wasn't defensive. Because when you fired it, first. Uh, okay, but it's not just a matter of the enemy opening fire with a firearm to attack. They open fire with a trigger switch when they drive up to you and destroy you. Okay. I mean, literally. But you there's also see ambulance the, drivers, nine-year-old children, you should see doctors the pictures, on their way to work. Whether it's Hamas in Palestine, in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, bad guys load and ambulances you, with explosives and, you, and kill innocent people. But not in the cases I cited. Uh, we're going to take a break in part two. Uh, we're going to talk to Eric Prince about some of his work in China and his relationship with the Trump administration. And we're going to hear from our very patient audience here in the Oxford Union. Join us for part two. <laughs> Welcome back. You're watching Head to Head on Al Jazeera English. My guest today is Eric Prince, the founder, former CEO of Blackwater, also a big supporter of and donor to President Donald Trump. Um, Eric, I want to talk to you about your relationship with President Trump in a moment. But before I do, just very 
briefly. You're currently Executive Deputy Chairman of Frontier Services Group, FSG, a Hong Kong-based security and logistics firm um, that you founded. Why is FSG opening a training center for security guards in, of all places, Xinjiang province in China, where up to a million Muslim Uyghurs are being held in basically concentration camps right now? There's a lot of misreporting on that. The company is not opening any training facility up there that was actually discussed at a board meeting. The, uh, the reporting got it wrong. The only, there was a, some kind of memorandum uh, signed for construction services, not training. The company doesn't do any training of any police or security forces. Why did it say that at last all? year? Why did your company say it was establishing training facilities? It, was gonna, it, was, it signed an MOU for construction well, they services. They put out a press release. March the 2nd, with your name on it. For construct, not my name, it was in, for construction your, services. Your name's on the press release. Your name's on the press release several times, and it says, I've got the press release quote here, Xinjiang, China, establishing training facilities and buying security equipment and vehicles. Uh, again, it was for construction services. It's the, training if, facilities. If, if you look at the actual translation from Mandarin to English, it was for construction services, <laughs> okay? The only sorry, look, sorry, sorry, the we didn't only, translate it. This only, is your company's English press release, with the respect. Only, <laughs> the only training services, the, the, the only training services the company does is for people like Bank of China employees or uh, China Airlines employees because they travel the world and they go to dangerous places. It's how so to you avoid. are training people in Xinjiang? No. So the press release was wrong? There is, the company has zero footprint in Xinjiang, China. So it's period. not establishing the training facility. It said it was establishing on March the 2nd, 2018 in an English language press release. The board has discussed this twice and there is not one dollar or RMB allocated for anything like that. Okay, and you've got nothing to do with what's going on with the Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang? Zero. Okay, but you do have a lot to do with the Chinese government. So for someone who sees himself as a great American patriot, veteran, ex-Navy SEAL, uh, America first, Donald Trump supporter, isn't it odd that you do so much security business with the Chinese government, which is seen by many, including by President Trump, as a major geopolitical adversary of the United States? Isn't that weird? Isn't that a conflict? Uh, well, again, the company doesn't do any security per se. It does some training for people to avoid being a victim of a, terror, of a, of a terrorism incident. There is no... Blackwater, uh, I'm sorry, no, no FSG. You sold Blackwater. You're right. <laughs> there is no, um, uh, no FSG employee that's armed doing uh, that kind of security. But you are working in China. You're Hong Kong based. The majority of your, sure. the majority no, of your company me, is let, Chinese owned, is it not? Uh, it's, well, it's retail investors, everything from mutual but funds. And majority Chinese, Chinese owned, yes or no? I don't know if it's majority, but there's a lot of Chinese ownership. Sure. How much? Uh, it's your company, you're the executive it's, it's, deputy chairman. Sure, no, it, it, it's, it's publicly listed and it's all publicly disclosed. So tell us. The fact is, the, the company does grocery delivery, trucking, all through Southern Africa. We do medevac. We're the biggest medevac provider for the But there's the no conflict between working for the Chinese and working for the U.S. as you want to do now in Afghanistan. You don't think there's a conflict there as look, an American patriot ex-veteran? Uh, look, America is a big trading partner of China and helping China connect its uh, logistics lines for better trade. I think countries that trade together tend to not uh, fight together, okay. fight against each uh, other. Sean McFay is a former private military contractor, former officer in the US Army, professor at Georgetown University, author of the book, The New Rules of War. Sean, is there a conflict of interest here? Is there a concern, do you think, in Washington DC where you're based? Is yes, a there's a big interest. So last year, the national defense strategy, which is the Pentagon's strategy for the world, shifted the first time in years away from counterterrorism counterinsurgency into the threats of Russia and China. And we all know that China uses its economic instruments of power to, you know, to, to look at they did to Sri Lanka. They took over a port as if they were a mafia don. Um, so it's not just economic trade, there's also a darker aspect to it. And many in Washington see you as one of their sort of weapons of war. Are you, are you a Chinese weapon of war? Absolutely not, because we're not doing any kind of training building their tactical What about the leverage that Sean makes the point about? The Look, economic leverage. The, the, the fact is, uh, what does the company do now? It does trucking and transportation from Southern Africa. Okay, you can deliver groceries from Cape Town all the way up through the DRC. We medevac, we fly people all over the continent, and we do significant air operations out of Malta, supporting, um, hopefully, oil operations in countries like Iraq, or Pakistan, or the hydro dams. Look, countries around the world, China shows up with a lot of money and a lot of people to do infrastructure projects. The Russians are showing up with muscle and weapons. And the United States has largely missed the boat. The one positive change the Trump administration has made is a change, the law changed last October for OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, the only part of the US government that actually makes money. 
and now they're, they're, they've shifted a huge budget away from the State Department okay. to OPEC so that it is managed and it allows more investment. They've also launched a trade countries. war with China, which might put you in two different camps at the same time. Let me ask Colonel Tim Collins this question. He's here. You're a famous officer in the British Army. Now you're chairman of your own uh, private security consultancy, New Century. How do you respond to critics who say, when you run these private for-profit companies, uh, you're only loyal to yourselves or to your bottom lines. You're not loyal to a national government. And that's a problem. That's, that makes you conflicted. What's your response to people who say that? Well, at the end of the day, there's a thing called international law, and nobody does anything outside. And if they do, and, uh, then they, they, they must be held accountable. The difficulty is the only people who will subject to and allow themselves to be regulated are the good guys. There are... Um, mercenary activity all over the world. The, the reality is that uh, many people innocently in this room don't realize that um, many governments in the world, particularly in Pakistan, India, um, Iran, Middle East, maintain people who they pay and deploy as contractors, and, and these are people who are committing atrocities. They won't be regulated. Okay, so let me put that point very briefly, Sean, very briefly. What's your response to the point about regulation? Do you think companies like Eric's are re as regulated as they should be? Well, I, I'm a little bit more skeptical about the power of international law in general about mercenaries because the thing about, you know, who's going to go into Yemen and arrest all those mercenaries? The UN? And if so, the mercenaries can shoot back, right? They can kill your law enforcement. And I'm not suggesting that Eric's, that would be Eric's plan, but Eric is part of a, of a broader trend of the rise of mercenaries. Where does this end? You know, private wars, wars without states. That's a, and what if the U.S. partakes in this? Uh, Eric, let me ask you this. You're a big supporter of Donald Trump. Uh, you've been questioned by special counsel Robert Mueller over the Russiagate investigation. He's looked at your laptop and your phones, I believe. You've also testified to Congress. In November 2017, you told Congress under oath that you played, quote, no official or really unofficial role in the Trump campaign. What you didn't tell Congress is that on August 3rd, 2016, uh, you were at a meeting during the campaign at Trump Tower with Don Jr., Trump's son, with Stephen Miller, then a campaign advisor to Trump, with George Nader, a former Blackwater colleague of yours who acts as a back channel to the Saudis, the Emiratis. He also happens to be a convicted pedophile. And also Joel Zamel, an Israeli expert on social media manipulation. How come you didn't mention that meeting to Congress, given it's so relevant to their investigation? Uh, I did. As part of the part of the investigations, I certainly uh, disclosed any uh, any meetings. The very very not few the, I had not in the congressional testimony you gave to the House. We went through it. You didn't mention anything about August 2016 meeting in Trump Tower. I they specifically that. asked you what context you have, and you didn't answer that. Uh, I don't believe I was asked that question. You were asked were there any communica formal communications or contact with the campaign. You said apart from writing papers, putting up yard signs. No, that's what you said. I've got the transcript of the conversation here. Sure. I mean, I might have been, uh, I, I think I was at Trump headquarters or the campaign headquarters. Maybe, Trump Tower, uh, August 3rd, 2016. You, possible. an Israeli dude, a back channel to the Emiratis and the Saudis, Don Jr., were Stephen there, Miller. We're there to talk about Iran policy. Are you there to talk about Iran policy? Mm -hmm. Don't you think that's something important to disclose to the House Intelligence Committee while you're under oath? I did. You didn't. We just went through the testimony. There's no mention <laughs> of the Trump Tower meeting in August 2016. Why not? I don't know if they got the transcript wrong. Oh, they got the transcript wrong. So if we go, I, I, I don't know. I remember. I remember uh, certainly. Discussing I mean, this is a problem for you because we know that Robert Mueller he hasn't been able to establish collusion yet, but he has got a lot of guys for lying to the authorities and not telling the whole truth. Is that a problem now? That even if you accidentally didn't tell them, that could come back and haunt you. I fully cooperated. And I haven't heard anybody. I haven't heard from anybody in more than nine months. I mean, I, I mean. Members of Congress, after they discovered this meeting, have talked about certain witnesses not telling the truth. But you believe you told Congress about this meeting, even though it's not in the transcript, just to be clear? I, I believe so, yeah. Okay. Um, you had another meeting, which they did talk to you about, in the Seychelles on 11th January 2017, a week before Trump's inauguration, where good old George Nader was there again on behalf of the Emiratis, as was top Russian oligarch Kirill Dmitriev, a close ally of Vladimir Putin's. The Emiratis saw that meeting as a, as a way of creating a back channel between Putin's guy... Dmitriev and Trump's guy, you, didn't they? I don't think so. I was there to talk to the uh, Emiratis about uh, Somalia and some of the other problem areas that uh, we'd uh, helped with before. Was it also about Iran? No. And it was, so how did you end up with a, with a Russian oligarch who runs the Russian Direct Investment Fund and is seen by the Emiratis as the messenger to Putin, they call him? 
Well, I, as I recall, the Emiratis were investors in that fund, and uh, any, fund manager, fund, any fund manager tends to travel to where their LP, their investors, uh, need them to be. But what were you chatting about with the Russian dude? Uh, I talked about it in testimony, and that's all I'm going to say. But it was just a kind of accidental meeting? Yes. Even though George and Ada, your former like colleague... Said, like, like I've said before, it lasted one beer, which doesn't take me very long. <laughs> So you flew halfway around the world to a secret meeting in the Seychelles to have one beer with no, Vladimir Putin's no, no. messenger. I was there to see the Emirati leadership. That's not what George Nader seems to be telling the Mullah folks right now. Does that worry you, that Nader's contradicting that, your testimony, that, your I, former colleague? I, I, I think it's uh, amazing for you to try to view into the Mueller testimony. That's, uh, that's mighty prescient. I mean, OK, that's, that's, what, that's what's being reported. OK. Um, I just want to bring in, you mentioned Iran, interestingly enough. I just want to bring in, very briefly before we move on, I know the audience are waiting. Uh, Gaith Abdul Ahad is an award-winning Guardian journalist from Iraq. You've covered conflicts across the Middle East. Um, when you hear about the Emiratis and Trump and the Saudis and the Israelis, what is that all about? I mean, Eric mentioned Iran. Is this all about Iran? I mean, of course, we are living, kind of people say it's a cold war. It's not a cold war anymore between the Emiratis, Saudis, the Israelis, and the Iranians on the other side. And... And what the Emiratis are doing, for example, in Yemen, and I think you worked with the Emiratis and you advised them at one point, they are actually implementing your Afghanistan plan. So if you see the Emirati war in Yemen, it is tens of thousands of mercenaries, local hired forces with skeleton troops from the Emiratis, a war that is being fought so viciously with no accountability whatsoever. Within the big arch of fighting the Iranians who didn't exist in Yemen, have you advocated using uh, private, sp private contractors to take on Iran to the Trump administration? No. You have a, you, people have accused you of advocating that in the past. You've talked about using private contractors to no. confront Iran? No? no? You see no role for a, a Blackwater slash FSG in any relation to Iran? No. Okay. Just to check. Before we go to the audience, I've got to ask one quest, last question. You are part of a group of high-profile Trump supporters, including Steve Bannon, Sheriff David Clark, and others, who are planning on raising private money to build a wall along the US-Mexico border. You even have a GoFundMe page. Uh, what I don't get, though, is I'm pretty sure I heard Donald Trump say that Mexico would be paying for the wall. Uh, don't discount Mexico actually paying for the wall. I think most uh, of us have, but yes. More, more news on that. <laughs> Look, there's a lot of places where it's federal land and, and, a, and a GoFundMe uh, individual effort is not uh, possible, but there's a lot of places where U.S. ranchers or U.S. landowners own land right up to the border. They are sick of their, their farms effectively being massive transit spots for drug and, uh, and criminal activity, and so they would welcome uh, that. The guy who started that is a triple amputee, okay, military veteran, who, who started it, and he's raised more than $20 million, and, and the cost per... But don't you feel per, foolish cost, asking the, people for money when, me, when Trump told us more than 100 times, people have counted, that Mexico would pay for the wall? So why do we need you and this guy and his GoFundMe page? Uh, because, Unless Trump lied to all of them. Because, I, I, again, don't discount Mexico actually paying for part you of the wall. You think they'll pay forward. for the wall? Uh, uh, there are things that, uh, that may happen that Mexico will end up paying. He but didn't say meantime, part of the wall, though, Eric. He didn't say, hey, Mexico's going to pay for part of the wall. He very of, explicitly uh, said, Mexico will pay for the wall. The last chapter is not written on that. Mark my words. So Mexico will pay for the wall. So then why are you fundraising? Uh, uh, you look, can't have it both ways. There's, Mexico will pay for the wall, but are, I'm going to raise money. Which one? Are, because people are frustrated. They're sick of not they're having They're frustrated more. that the president can't get Mexico to pay for the wall two years into his presidency after claiming they're hundred times. They're frustrated. It is would. a national security issue when you have thousands of people crossing the border with a lot of drugs. Look, America has a huge opium epidemic. Ap and epidemic. you know the majority of those and drugs come through legal points of entry. I'm talking about the funding. Trump said Mexico would fund the wall. Did he lie to people when he said that? What used to be a bipartisan issue, the Democrats have made a hyperpartisan issue. Did he lie to us when he said Mexico would pay for the wall, given you're now trying to get Americans to pay for I the wall? I don't believe the president has lied. And like I said, the last chapter on Mexico paying for the wall is not done yet. Okay. Mark my words. So we'll wait for some more. Okay. In the meantime, Americans are going to pay for it through your fundraising. Let's go to our audience who have been waiting uh, very patiently. I'm going to go to the front here, and then we'll go to the back. Gentleman here with the beard. Uh, being originally Iraqi and having spent some time in Iraq, I've seen how Iraqis still shudder at the name Blackwater reminded of the endless aggression, the use of weapons as car horns, or even the use of tear gas as car traffic control. Do you not think that Blackwater has a role to play in perpetuating violence in Iraq, as well as laying the foundation for the creation of Al-Qaeda and ISIS? There's 110,000 Iraqi civilians have died after Blackwater ended any involvement in Iraq. Blackwater was not the problem in Iraq. A very sectarian government dominated by 
uh, Iranian uh, sectarian units that have been pounding on the Sunnis and now pounding on the Kurds is probably the thing that led to the, that outcrop of, of ISIS. But m even if that's part of it, most military experts, including US military experts, agree that high-profile incidents, whether it's Abu Ghraib or others, did help act as a recruiting sergeant for groups like ISIS that didn't exist before the US invaded Iraq. So something like the Nisal Square massacre that is still remembered in Baghdad may well have done, helped people say, you know what, I'm going to go join an insurgent group now. That's how Americans treat us, private contractors, shoot nine-year-old kids in the street, shoot mothers with their children. I think massive unemployment and, and an Iraqi government that is, you know, when... when I'm not um, disputing that. I'm agreeing with you. I'm look, saying, but when, you when, discount that an Iraqi sitting at home seeing the Nisal Square massacre doesn't think, you know what, I might as well go join the insurgency if this is how Americans treat us, innocent people. No, that's not, uh, you know, look, there is a, a justice process that served. There was actually accountability. Uh, lots of investigation for that, but like I Hold said... On, that's not what I asked. That's not what I asked, Eric. You don't answer the question I asked. If an Iraqi sitting at home sees the Nisal Square massacre, you don't think that might incite him to join an insurgent group? There's no sure. logical leap. Uh, of course, bad news travels fast and it irritates people. And you created the is, bad news, is what this gentleman is suggesting. <laughs> but we did not create the 110,000 Iraqi civilians that were murdered um, okay, you didn't ISIS kill all of them. And okay. by Hashtag Shabi and the Iranian security. Right, let's units. go back to the audience. Uh, gentleman here in the red tie. Um, I'd like to ask what you think um, some of President Trump's greatest foreign policy achievements have been thus far and what he should focus on uh, over the next two years to secure re election. Well, you know, the president, he campaigned against endless wars. And the Pentagon, look, there, there is a real military industrial complex. But he's trying to stop that. He is trying to remove or reduce the U.S. presence in Afghanistan and in Syria. He's been uh, getting the North Koreans to the table. And if he can actually negotiate a, an end to the Korean War, it'll be a magnificent first step. And I think uh, if, that's, if that's the case, then the U.S. should be willing to pull all troops out of South Korea uh, and end uh, the U.S. presence in Korea, which we've, been, which we've had for 70-some years. You're not a fan of Iran, as we discussed pr briefly. Should he negotiate with Iran, too? Why is it that Iran is the evil regime, nobody should talk to them, but North Korea, I send him love letters, he sends me love letters? Uh, I, to my knowledge, I think there certainly is still back-channel uh, negotiations with the Iranians as well, but uh, you know, they continue to do um, okay. uh, you know, questionable things in Syria. Okay, uh, let's go back to the audience. Let's go to the lady here and then the gentleman there. Uh, stand up. Hi, this is also with rega in regards to the August 3rd meeting of 2016. Uh, you said that you mentioned it in your testimony to the House Intelligence Committee. I have the, the transcript right here of wow. the okay. testimony on the 30th of November 2016. You didn't. I could read if, from it if we you want We don't have to. time for you to read exactly. the transcript of the House. So why didn't you? Why, why are you saying you did when you Do you want to have another go answering this question? Why didn't you mention it in your sure. testimony I, if it was nothing to hide? Not all the discussion that day was, was transcribed. And that's a fact. Okay. But your answers to the questions suggest that there was no involvement. That they asked you, for example, have you had any, me any meetings with the UAE delegation prior to the Seychelles meeting? And the August 3rd meeting was prior to the Seychelles meeting. George Nader is a representative of okay. MBZ. Okay, let, let Eric respond. Like I said, not everything was transcribed from that discussion. <laughs> you weren't there. You've been very kind of, I admire, you've been very forthcoming tonight. On this issue, you're very... Don't want to say much. Are you worried? Are no. you worried about Mueller? Nope, not at all. No? Okay. Uh, let's go back to the audience. Let's go to the gentleman there. Um, I was caught up in this Square going back to my hotel covering a story. At the time, it was mayhem, as you know, and we saw people getting killed. My own driver was injured. Now, we discussed this with you before, Eric. Well, just going back, what lessons have you learned from it? And, and would you have done things differently? then if you knew what you know now? Sure. Uh, I, wouldn't have, uh, I wouldn't ever do security for the State Department again. It just wasn't worth it. Uh, it wasn't worth the damage or the, the, the horror to the company. Uh, if we were going to do it, I would have insisted, like we did for any NGO work that we did, is that we have cameras, okay? Because the camera serves as that third-party neutral observer because uh, it's very easy to second-guess something that happens, uh, you know, days ago or weeks or months ago but it's very different when you have to he's, make a split second decision. Care. You're saying cameras, that, the implication being that you don't accept you did anything wrong there. Had there been cameras, your men would be vindicated. Is that, is that what you're saying? Do you want to be explicit about that? Look, because they've been found guilty in American courts. I know the courts you don't like, but they've been found guilty in American courts. After the fourth time of trying them. Okay, they've been found guilty in Correct. an American court. And we had numerous other incidents where there was a shooting 
and we were accused, and when okay, law in this all square, and do you believe law, your men did anything wrong? And when law enforcement authorities viewed the tapes, okay. there was no problem. Do you believe in this all square your men did anything wrong? It's a very simple question. In hindsight, sure. If it's an innocent civilian, every innocent civilian that's killed is a tragedy, is a horror, and we tried very hard to avoid that. That's why 40 men, 41 men died doing that mission, shielding other people from enemy bullets who were trying to kill them and okay. slaughter them or hang them from a bridge some, and burn them. Okay, we can take some more questions. Lady there with her hand up. Do you wait for the microphone to come to you? Yes, I was a U.S. television journalist in Iraq during and after the invasion. I saw Blackwater people humiliate and terrorize Iraqis. They were hostile to journalists and they were hostile to NGOs. Why should you get a contract to do the same thing in Afghanistan? How did, how did you, first of all, how did you know that they were Blackwater personnel? Oh, because they very, very clearly, walking around, not just driving cars, walking around, they were Blackwater. As journalists, we knew who Blackwater was. I, look, they let us know they were not soldiers, they were Blackwater. It's were, very easy to tell. Ma'am, I'm sorry, there was hundreds and hundreds of companies employing U.S., NATO, and other country I veterans. the difference between, it, between Blackwater and NATO. I'm sorry, but I, it's I, very I'm easy saying, to tell. I, I, I don't think you're that sharp that you can tell the difference between a Polish guy, a French guy, or a Canadian guy. Do you think you're guy. that sharp to tell the difference? Excuse, well, okay, sure. All right. Before this, before this gets out I, of hand, we'll go back. Absolutely. You guys aren't going to agree. We track the, you're we, not going to agree. Before this gets out of hand, we'll carry, on with, we the, we'll the carry on with the audience. We'll go to this gentleman with the tie and the suit. So Afghanistan been uh, in war since 2001 and fighting 20 international terrorist groups. Since 2014, the Afghan National Security Forces have been doing this by themselves. Uh, so how do you justify that you will get a contract and go and do the war in Afghanistan, given that you're making money out of this business and you'll ever want to conclude this business there? And one point, okay, please no, do no, us a favor and have a bold line between death of mercenaries of death and democracy, and it's totally up to the people of Afghanistan to decide who is their next president. Thank you. Are, are you, can I just ask, are you, are you Afghan yourself? Yes. A and you believe that Afghans don't want? Never. More? Like, that's definitely never. Okay, but deal with the first question okay, about, uh, that's you have a self-interest in perpetuating the conflict, because you get paid. Ah, uh, here's the thing. Of the $62 billion, right now the U.S. spends $5 billion supporting the Afghan security forces. $57 billion is the cost of U.S. presence there. That's going away, okay? The support for the Afghan security forces, the airlift, the medevac, which is wholly inadequate right now because Afghan soldiers are dying at a rate of 30 and 40 per day. If there's not a skeletal support supply provided to them, Hamid Karzai, I'm sorry, Ashraf Ghani himself said the Afghan forces will collapse in less than six months. I say it's more like six weeks, okay? So there has to be some kind of capability to keep the Afghan security forces upright and able to function so that Afghanistan can actually have a free election to, and they should be totally free to choose their next leader. I okay, agree. Eric, let me ask you this. Despite all the things you and Blackwater have been accused of, some of which we've discussed tonight, but there's so much more, uh, you said in 2007, quote, I sleep the sleep of the just. I'm not feeling guilty. Just wondering, is that still the case today? You still have no regrets, no guilt, no ruined sleep at all over all those innocent lives taken by Blackwater employees? None? Look, the fact is the company did what it was asked to. It was asked to prote protect. We saved thousands and thousands of people. We saved many, many wounded US soldiers well beyond the scope of the contract. Okay, we did what we were asked. Any, any injury, any civilian that's injured in a car crash, or, or, shot, or an accidental shot in the head, shooting. Or nine-year-old children shot in the head. Correct. And, and, and since, since long after Blackwater was involved, 110,000 Iraqi civilians have been killed in that same conflict yeah. by ISIS, so, by incompetent so, government. So when I have George Bush on the show, I'll ask him about his sleep. I'm asking about the people your guys killed. Does it keep you awake at night? We were asked to do a job, and we performed very, very well. We'll have to leave it there. Thanks to our audience here in the Oxford Union. Thanks to our panel of experts who've come tonight. And thanks to Eric Prince for joining me on Head to Head. That's our show. Head to Head will be back next week. Thank you. Thanks so much.